Isaiah chapter 6, please. I'm reminded of another song. I stand amazed in the presence of the man of Galilee. Every day, as believers, we are to walk in the presence of Christ because he is present. The light words that he said and the short words that he said, whether they're deep or seemingly profound or seemingly simple, or although I am with you always, even unto the end of the age, have a, a definite ring in the believer's heart. Our God has many names, and these names of God are descriptive. They're descriptive of his character. They describe his power. They describe his attributes. And, and they're critical to us to understand his greatness and his majesty and all the actions that he took and will take and all the promises that he will keep for his people. Lord, Holy, Almighty God, Jehovah, Alpha and Omega, the Everlasting God, the Prince of Peace, the Morning Star, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Redeemer, Captain of our salvation, Mediator, Cornerstone, Creator, Lion of the tribe of Judah, Counselor, Shepherd, the Cornerstone, the Head of the Corner, the Lamb of God, and the rock of our salvation, and many more. And it is His majesty that we want to meditate on today and hopefully begin to understand a little bit better. Remember that we can never fully grasp or fathom the depth of the Lord of glory and His infinite character. It's infinite but we can begin to grasp His majesty as we humble ourselves before His presence. Now I am convinced, after 40 years of pastoring, that every person is in a different place spiritually. But one place we need to be is seeing ourselves in His presence from moment to moment and being willing to set aside ourselves so, so that we can see who he is instead of seeing ourselves all the time. It's a difficult thing to die to self and to live unto God. And I don't know that there are uh, as many Christians as I would like to see being totally committed to this principle of dying to self and being alive unto God and walking in his presence and feeling the real depth and beauty of their relationship to Christ. The greatness of what we have is one thing to say, it's another to experience it. In Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah writes, Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of man shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Keep, keep this in your mind, that the God that we serve is bigger than we limit him to in our own mind at times. We have difficulty, we have circumstances which are impossible for us to deal with in our human life and this time on the earth, and trials which come which are more difficult, that don't have any understanding of how they're going to turn out, what's going to take place next. But we have this truth, that our God is real, He's alive, He's on His throne, and He's present with us everywhere we go, awake or asleep. Amen. Now that's a tremendous blessing. It's not possible to enter into a more complete understanding of God's majesty and holiness until we are first humbled by His greatness. And that's one of the things we're going to see in Isaiah 6 as we look at it more carefully. Let me repeat it. It is, it is not possible to enter into a more complete understanding of God's majesty and holiness until we first are humbled by His greatness. 
Keep it in mind. God is always great. Man is not always humbled. And until we get to this place in our life where we really need to be, we will never see him as high and exalted and high and lifted up because we only see ourselves as being lifted up. We must set aside ourselves. And I fear that many Christians run from a deeper understanding and examination of God's holiness and power because it would mean that an absolute capitulation and surrender of every area of their lives. Think about it. I witnessed to a man one time, he said, if I believe this and I come to Christ and I am saved the way you're telling me, I'm going to have to change everything in my life. Well, no, you don't have to change everything in your life, I said. God will change it all. It's not a question of I don't want to anymore. It's just that I'm not, I don't want to be, I, I can't do it anymore because I don't want to do it anymore. God changes our life. He humbles us by the circumstances of life to see his greatness. And it's never until we're in trouble or having affliction or difficulty that we often don't do anything about it until that happens and we step back and we're in this valley until we get to the chance to climb that mountain and see the greatness of who God really is. There's no mountain without a valley and no valley without a mountain. The holiness of God, knowing the depth of God's greatness and to seek, seeking to grow in our knowledge of his judgment and power and mercy and holiness takes time. It takes energy. It takes personal examination and personal revival. And yes, if, if we enter into his presence, sometimes we should do it with fear and trepidation, but also enter in humble by the fact that as our creator and the creator of the universe, he takes time to listen to our prayers and help us, even though we are saved, depraved sinners. He still loves us. Our God is great. Our God is great. Amen. Our God is great. Our God is great. Keep reminding yourself this because of the tremendous truth that it brings about and, and changes that take place in our life once we realize this. We have an opportunity to approach the creator and sustainer of the universe. Can we even fathom this? Are, are, are we ready for this lifelong task of entering into his presence? How can we demonstrate that we are worthy to enter into his presence? Well, the answer is we can't because we're not worthy. But the Lord has provided a means to accomplish this task by searching out his greatness in our lives through the word of God and prayer. God takes people who are unrighteous and unholy, redeems them, giving them the righteousness of Christ and the holiness of Christ, and then allows them in the presence of, his, of God the Father through the person of Christ as our mediator any time we want, any time of need or not in need. How can we do this? Well, I think we need to obey and we need to bow before our Maker and Redeemer and allow God to reveal Himself to us. I mean, this is God's ministry to the human race, the revelation of himself to man. And this is why in Hebrews 1 it says that God has spoken unto us through his Son and in his Son. How do we do this? Well, we do this by praying. Jesus said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he it is that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. How does God manifest himself to us? Well, on our knees, humbled before him, God works in our lives to reveal his truth to mere human beings who are sinners. We come to God in our time of need. We're on our knees and we say, God, I cannot do this myself. And God manifests himself to us. I like what Spurgeon said. He said, prayer is the longing of the soul to hold communion with the Most High, the desire of the heart to obtain blessings at His hands. I need your help, God. 
I need your blessing in my life. What I'm going to be going through, I cannot sustain myself. I can't deal with it. In Isaiah 5, 15 and 16, And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled, but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. So through it all, our God will receive honor, and he'll see us, his work is sanctified in our lives and continue to deal with us. His anger, or Isaiah said in Isaiah 5.25, for all this and all the things that Israel had done wrong, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. No matter where we are in our life, God reaches for his people. And I can remember being away from the Lord for those years when I was a cop, and I can remember watching God at work in my life and reminding me who he is and showing me what a fool that I have been. And finally coming to this place where I realized who he is and who I'm not, or who I could be with him in my life again. Why waste everything? Now we read in Isaiah chapter 6, a, a most profound <coughs> chapter, I think, maybe in the Bible. For God to reveal himself to a man, even though he was a great prophet. He did this at a specific time. And this is the date of Isaiah's vision. Uh, I, I mean, uh, Isaiah's vision came, it says, Uzziah, Uzziah took the throne as a teenager, by the way, and he reigned for 52 years. And while the prophet Zechariah preached, Uzziah was faithful to God and did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to 2 Kings chapter 15. Uzziah's name spread abroad, even to the entering end of Egypt, 2 Chronicles 26. He was well known. He was doing the right thing. And his pride, his personal pride, led to his downfall. He entered into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And Azariah, the high priest, confirmed him, confronted him about this, saying that it wasn't right for him to usurp the ministry of the priests. And Uzziah was struck with leprosy at that time. And he died in 740, 739 B.C. And then this vision that says that in the year that King Uzziah, Uzziah died, Israel, Isaiah knew the history of Uzziah. He knew him well. And he knew God's judgment upon his life was this leprosy. And with this information as a backdrop for us, Isaiah is now prepared to have this vision of the Lord. Now stop and think for a moment. In your life, can you get a clear vision of God if you don't seek it? The answer is no. God wants to manifest himself and reveal himself to his people. But it isn't until he fulfills all of the circumstances of our life at a certain point when we have humbled ourselves and been prepared, that's when God begins to reveal himself. Now this is unique, I know, because not all of us will have a vision of God in this manner. We have it in the scripture to study. But all of us can get a spiritual vision, a new vision of how great our God is, if we'll take time and realize that God has been preparing us our whole lives for this one moment of absolute surrender to him. Think about that. Here's what Isaiah said. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. In Hebrew, this is a participle. He was continually sitting upon this throne. He wasn't going to give it to anyone else. No one else owned it. It belongs to him. Amen? All right. So when Ezekiel had a similar vision of the throne of God, it says, and the appearance of a man sitting upon it. And this is what he wrote in Ezekiel 1.28. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, listen carefully, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice from the one who spoke. Think about in the, new, in the Old Testament as well as the New, 
places where men were going to be shown a vision of God, or when they saw God for who, how great he is, the reaction that took place in their lives. Now remember, we, we said earlier that some people don't want to make a full commitment to Christ because if they do, things are going to have to change in their lives. There's going to be a recommitment, a revival, a rededication of their life. They're going to have to fall on their face before God and say, you are right, I'm wrong. And that's sometimes hard for people to do. Genesis 17, uh, verse 1 through 3. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between thee, me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face. Leviticus 9, 23 and 24. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed the altar, the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. Watch this trend. Deuteronomy 10, uh, excuse me, Daniel 10, verses 5 through 8. Then I lifted up my eyes, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body also was like the burl, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like the color of polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of the multitude. And I, Daniel, I alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them. So they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone. And I saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption and I retained no strength. When Daniel saw the Lord as high and lifted up, he was too weak to even stand before him. Judges 13, 19 to 20. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering, and he offered it upon a rock unto the Lord, and the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on, for it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar that the angel of the Lord, which is a theophany, Christ in the Old Testament, ascended in the flame of the altar. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. I submit to you that when you see God for who he really is, the appropriate place is on your face. On your face. When Billy Graham was a young preacher in South Carolina, he and some friends were praying daily in his house. And his friends were praying for Billy Graham because he was being called to be an evangelist. And Graham fell on his face. And his friends knelt next to him and laid their hands on him and prayed for him and prayed for the power of God to be upon his life. Because this is the place he needed to be. And in his biography, in his testimony, he claims this. As the time when God changed his life on his face. Agree or disagree with all the other stuff that happened in his life. But there's a man that preached the gospel in millions of, to millions of people. It begins with man being humble and seeing the Lord as high and lifted up. Now, it's interesting because you don't see this in English, but it is this way in Hebrew. High and lifted up are actually verbs. They're two different kinds of verbs, but they're both participles. They're ongoing verbs. In other words, the Lord is continually on high. The Lord is continually lifted up. It's not that he's just there for that moment. It's eternity that this is his place as God. He never changes, and his rightful place as the sovereign God of the universe belongs only to him. And when we think we can run our own life and we fail time after time and finally realize who he is and come to him, this is when we find peace of mind. 
This is when we find the greatness of God at work in our lives. Amen? Mm -hmm. Think through this now. His train filled the temple. It's also a participle. That is, his robe filled the temple to abundance completely. He is a priest whose robes constantly fill the temple. It's not a one-time event. They fill the temple because his ministry is a ministry as a high priest. And it's perfect and absolute and complete and infinite in every area, every aspect. There's no time when you can come to the Lord Jesus where he's not available to listen because he's your priest and he's available. His train fills the temple. He's always available. The scripture says, and above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, two covering the feet, and two covering the eyes, and two that caused them to fly about. Now even the seraphims worship and adore the Lord God. They know better than we do, <coughs> excuse me, the greatness of who he is. Their wings covered their face, I think showing humility that exists before the Lord. Their wings covered their feet, showing their desired, desire to serve the Lord. And their, <coughs> their wings were, clothed, were used to fly, showing their constant labor for God. <coughs> I have to apologize. Some of you apologize. Some of you know that this is allergy season. <coughs> <coughs> I think that's one of the main things I'm looking for, getting to glory. No allergies. <laughs> Someone said, oh, this now, the luck, Pastor, with your luck, you'll be allergic to gold. <laughs> so the seraphim, seraphims were close to God, knew him better than anyone else. And one, one seraphim cried unto another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. You see, they understood. Until we see God, as holy, 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 our lives will never be really different. If we're a new creature in Christ, it's because we have gained the beauty of Christ's holiness and his righteousness in our lives. In Exodus 15, 11, it says, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like unto thee, glorious, in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? <coughs> no one is like him. <coughs> Revelation 4, 8, and 9. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night. What do they say? Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. That's the person of the Lord Jesus. Find out who you are. First, find out who God is. God's eternal plan of redemption included the sending of his son to die for the sins of the world, making it possible for you to be redeemed. Make it possible for you to see him for who he is, high and lifted up. Make it possible for you to see him as a resurrected Savior, eternal in the heavens. Amen? Waiting there and waiting so that he can come again and take you off this earth because he's sovereign. Notice in Isaiah 6 that the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house uh, excuse me, and the house was filled with smoke, Isaiah 6, 4. The temple only exists because of the power of God and his presence filling the temple. And his presence is seen and felt as the doorposts moved at his voice. Remember in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came? The, sh the word, it shook. Remember at the death of Christ, the earth shook. Think of the events that will take place during the tribulation, all to shore forth the greatness and power of God, to shake the temple, to get people's attention 
to help the Jews to understand this now. And when Isaiah saw all of this, he said, Woe is me. Woe is me. This was a time of personal self-examination as God revealed himself to Isaiah. For when you see God for who he is, you can't help but examine yourself. The other day I saw a picture of a man on the internet. He was bench pressing 625 pounds. His arms were bigger than my head. His four. Big, strong man. And here's what I thought. I could never do that. We, we have a natural tendency to compare ourselves, right? So when we see God as high and lifted up, we see his power, man's power, nothing. 625 pounds, man, it's nothing to God. God's power is not measurable. And we look at that and we step back and we say, compared to this, I am nothing. I can do all things, however, through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Woe is me. In Acts chapter 9, when Paul was describing Paul's uh, conversion off the road to Damascus, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth. And he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. You cannot fight God and win. When God reveals himself, it causes personal introspection and self-examination, revealing the heart of God. See, we see God for who he is. And God reveals his heart to us. And as we look at our own heart, we see it as unclean. We see it compared to the greatness and the holiness of God. And this revelation is really a revealing of the nature of man that brought about the complete repentance of the prophet. I've been studying this passage for many years. And in the last month, I have spent so much time on this, I couldn't get out of verse 1. I couldn't get past the greatness of who God is. How can I explain this to myself? How can I share the greatness of this with other people if I can't imagine the greatness of who God is myself? So in the last month, I've been thinking this through very carefully for myself. I am undone, said Isaiah, because I'm a man of unclean lips. The word undone in Hebrew means feeling as if you're going to die or be destroyed utterly. So in essence, he said, I am a man, I am undone. I'm a man who could die just by having this vision. And he was struck with the fear and awesome power of the God that he served. And he realized that all the words that he must speak have to come from this God who is sovereign in the universe. Amen? And he said, And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I, Isaiah realized his own sin first. And then he began to realize the sin of the people that he was teaching. <coughs> he realized that every person that he loved was unclean. And the word uh, unclean here means impure, religiously, or in politics even, or in government. It deals with all of those things ethically. They were without excuse. He was without excuse. All of Israel and Isaiah himself were unclean. And when you meet God, that's the first thing you see. You know, in redemption... When the gospel is given, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you cannot be saved until you realize first that you're a <coughs> sinner, that you're unclean. Yeah. You, you can't, because why would you come to a Savior to save you from nothing? 
You have to realize you're a sinner first to realize you need this Savior to redeem you. You need to find God and find out how great He is and let Him change your life. But until you see yourself as a sinner, you can't, I don't think you can be saved, personally. He saw all of this. He said, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When I saw Him, when I saw the King, when I saw the Lord of hosts, this is when full realization came to me that I am nobody and I'm unclean. This concept is the basis for revival. Revival has always begun with a few people who realize their own inadequacy and failure and determine before God to trust Him for everything. Absolutely everything. In this church are spiritual people, people who love the Lord, people who want to honor God. But I submit to you that any person in here could be on their knees at any time asking God to open their heart and to cleanse them more and to teach them more and to bring them more into His presence. In Revelation 1, 13 to 18, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, there was one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white as wool and as white as snow and his eyes as a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace and his voice was the sound of many waters and he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, said John, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. I'm no one to stand before this great God that I serve. And yet God in his goodness will let you stand before him at the Bema Seat Judgment and give an account of your life and let you enter into his presence for eternity. Extraordinary truth. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. So what is a proper way to view the Lord? Um, I like to keep it simple for myself. I'm not from Missouri, so I don't have that saying in my life, so you have to show me first. I think it's called the show me state. But when God does reveal himself, it ought to prove to us his greatness. No doubt about it. In Revelation 4.2, the Apostle John said, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one that sat on the throne. That's where we begin. It is Christ and only Christ who is enthroned in glory as the Son of God. Amen. Amen? Amen. When Simon Peter saw it, this was the catch of fishes, I think, Bill, by the way, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. When God revealed, when Jesus revealed his power to Peter. Job, I just read one, uh, Revelation 1, 16 and 17. In Job, Job says this, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. I think that as believers, this is where we need to be. To start again, to jumpstart our Christian life, to realize that we have been neglectful and apathetic, not doing the things that we need to do, not being where we need to be. And we need to get on our knees before God and mean business with God. Too many Christians over the years had played Christian for too long. Being a Christian is an issue of dedication, consecration, revival, and commitment. And if we believe this gospel to be the truth, and see our God as high and lifted up. What choice do we have 
but to get on our knees before God and ask Him to forgive us for our own failure, our own sin, our own apathy, see ourselves as unclean, and do what needs to be done to honor Christ in all things. <laughs> and God will lay it on your heart what He wants you to do. How far to carry this. So if God says in His Word, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, that's a decision you made already. To present your body as a living sacrifice, that's another decision that needs to be made. But only you can make it. Only we can make these things personally. What am I going to do with the calling of God upon my life? What are you going to do with the calling of God upon your life? What does it mean? Are you willing to get on your knees for a few minutes and say, God, forgive me. Help me to stay on track. Help me to see you for who you are. This is not true confession time. This invitation time is an invitation for you to examine between you and God alone your life. As I have to do that too. So as I close this at this prayer time, what I'm going to ask you to do is to just bow where you are, kneel where you are, do what you have to do. Talk to God for a few minutes. Make this relationship that you have with God so superior and so great that you have no place else to go but to turn to him who is high and lifted up. That's a decision that only each of us individually can make and it honors God. I think we need a fresh vision of our God because it's our God who's going to be exalted in judgment. Let's stand together. people would see the need to even get on their knees at this very moment now and seek you before all things and bow before you and be humbled by the greatness of who you are and I pray that during this invitation that this would take place in our hearts in our minds Set aside embarrassment and realize the opportunity that we have to bow before you in all things. In Christ's name, amen. I'd like you to bow your head still. We're going to sing a song that all of us know, Change My Heart, O God. And while we sing this, I'm going to ask you, you don't have to leave your seat, just kneel where you are. Ask God to help you. Ask him for a, to, a, to envision him in a greater way. 